Welcome to Christ the King Sunday. I know you all know exactly what this feast day means, right? Bear with me. Before we begin, though, grace and peace to you from God, who endlessly gives us glimpses of the kingdom of God through humbleness, justice, love, and mercy. Amen. Church, you put your right hand in. You put your right hand out. You put your right hand in, and you... You do the hokey pokey, and you turn yourself around. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, friends, that's what it's all about, right? And I wish it was that easy, because our text for today is certainly not. There's so much here, and I only have a few minutes with you, so buckle up. How many of you came to church today or turned or tuned in online to our service and thought, why, yes, I want to hear the crucifixion story today? Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm not going to lie, it's a little strange to hear this story outside of Lent, let alone Good Friday. I'd even say it's actually kind of shocking. But here we are as ELCA Lutherans at Trinity Lutheran Church and Schools, and we follow the New Revised Common Lectionary. It is prescribed for today. Now, the New Revised Common Lectionary, that might sound like a big churchy word, it is. This runs a three-year cycle, which allows us to hear more or less the entire Bible. Each year is assigned a gospel. Year C, what we are leaving, was Luke. Year A, what we are moving towards, is Matthew. Year B is Mark. John is read throughout all the three years during Lent and Holy Week. Christ the King Sunday marks the end of the church year. It's our new year. And all God's people said, Happy New Year! <laughs> so we must ask why our lectionary forebearers intentionally place this story on this Sunday. It's right before Thanksgiving and right before the first Sunday in Advent when we're about to journey several weeks with captivating stories about angels and miracles and the impossible happening. Well, that's the whole point. We are reminded that we are worshiping a crucified king more than a virgin birth. And what more to reflect on this, not in the context of a reflective and repentful Lent, but in a time of harvest, generosity, abundance, and extensive gatherings. So now, what is Christ the King, Reign of Christ Sunday? These titles are interchangeable. Uh, the more inclusive language one is the latter. And we can talk more about that anytime you want. But Christ the King Sunday began in 1925 with Pope Pius XI. Here are the three reasons behind why the feast day began. The document states that nations would see that the church has the right to freedom and immunity from the state. That leaders and nations would see that they are bound to give respect to Christ that the faithful would gain strength and courage from the celebration of the feast as we are reminded that Christ must reign in our hearts and our minds and our wills and our bodies. So now I ask you, what was going on in Europe in 1925? The Reconstruction period after World War I. This is when the church wanted to be extremely clear about whom we follow. God and Christ, period. Looking at this passage again, it suddenly becomes a bit more engaging, especially in the present and light of the past U.S. elections. Who do we choose to follow? Republicans or Jesus? Democrats or Jesus? Presidents or Jesus? As I said, there's so much we can discuss in this passage, but I want to focus mostly on verse 34. Now, we read the inclusive Bible translation. I know you're probably more familiar with this one. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In his final moments, this crucified king didn't seek revenge, violence, and destruction, but offered forgiveness. And this passage is quite remarkable because it only happens in the Gospel of Luke. Let's rapid fire here. These bandits, criminals, however you want to describe them, they're very interesting characters. Who are they? 
The bandits are most likely social bandits, not highway robbers as often interpreted. It's often said that uh, these protesters were against the Roman Empire, not that different from Jesus. They also wanted liberation from Rome, but most likely for Jewish liberation and not necessarily the kingdom of God. We usually think of one of them as a good bandit and the other one as a bad bandit. But remember, they're both people. They get a lot of things mistaken in their short dialogue while on the cross with Jesus, but the subject of salvation hangs the thickest in the air. Jesus is asked, let him save himself, and then twice dared save yourself, each time with the implication that by doing so, Jesus will prove himself and thereby verify the titles of Messiah and the King of the Jews. However, Jesus remains silent. After all, how can we ever receive a Messiah who does not act like a Messiah? How can we see salvation if no one is being saved? But again, Jesus remains silent. Let's jump now to uh, verse 43. And again, this is the translation that you're maybe a little more familiar with. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in... For a dying man, these words spoken by the crucified Christ must have been astonishing. Pause and reflect on that. Jesus' last words to another human being before his own death were forgiveness. That word, forgiveness. It's a very complicated word when you translate it from the Greek. Remember, that's the original language that these Gospels were written in. There is no perfect translation of the word in Greek. The word aphasis can be best described as permitting, letting go, releasing, or to neglect. I remember my Greek professor described it best this way, it's an action rather than a word. It's like a closed fist that slowly begins to open. It has nothing to do with the other person's actions, but yours and how you choose to react. Release and let go. It's an opening up of the heart, allowing love to pour in. Forgiveness is the stone that rolls away for resurrection and new life. Forgiveness is for everyone, leading to love, which is what the gospel is all about. Love is grace, and we are all worthy of it. And I know it's hard for us to believe in the gracious God, the forgiving God, and the God who would love us even when we disappoint and sin. But Jesus' stories of forgiveness are legendary, and we just spent an entire year going through them. Jesus spent much of his ministry describing the kingdom of God as having different rules and expectations from the rules and laws and penalties of humanity. The kingdom of God is a wasteful son returning to a father's loving arms a shepherd searching for one lost coin, a weed grown in a garden to provide shelter for the birds, a rich man's feast open to the poor and the lame. This is what the reign of Christ looks like. Author and theologian Nancy Lynn Westfield writes, we would rather have had Jesus say that God loves the people we like and the people we say we are like, and that God does not love the people we do not like, and the people we say are not like us. We would prefer if God did not love the crackheads and the addicts and the adulterers and the thieves and the prostitutes and the rebellious teenagers and the disgruntled employees. We would prefer it if paradise were exclusively for the nice people the clean people, the polite people, the well-behaved people, the right people. This kind of forgiveness is a challenging notion for many of us. It's certainly challenging for me. Like many of you, I have a hurt done to me so deeply that it runs the risk of consuming my essence and my source of joy daily but I believe that forgiveness is the only way through it. 
And whether I believe it or not, at least saying the words out loud moves me that much closer to believing it. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. Forgiveness is the most challenging journey any of us will ever take. And please hear me that this does not excuse the behavior done to you by that person. Oh no, that's for them and their relationship with God to work out, not yours. But I can choose how I react. As Christians, we have a confessional faith, not because we are weak, but because God is strong and God is love. Can I get an amen? Amen. There is grace for people we do not like, and there is grace for us, too. We confess because God's saving grace will heal and restore and redeem and forgive those whom God has created and whom God loves fiercely. Thank God that God gives the grace and not us. So here's my hope for you. As you go into this holiday season, what gift of forgiveness can you give yourself? How can forgiveness as a daily practice work its way into your life? Who needs forgiveness in your life? What tight fist are you clenching, just begging to be released? Jesus spent his entire ministry teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God. One of Jesus' last acts was forgiveness, and that is today and always. We, you, will be with him in paradise. Now, put your left hand in, put your left hand out, Put your left hand in and shake it all about. We do the hokey pokey and we turn ourselves around. Forgiveness is what it's all about. Thanks be to God.